I just sense there's something very sacred about tonight. I mean, all our Friday nights we've had together have been special, but I just... I just sense something special tonight about his presence here. And everyone comes with different needs. And there's no way to just guess what each person needs, you know, but somehow I just believe the Lord is going to meet with us in unique ways. Keep seeking him. Keep believing that he's in this room. Stay focused on him. Remember the verse tonight. It's without faith. It's impossible to please God. Is that the desire of your heart tonight? Where you go, I just want to please him. You know, we've been talking about how God loves us regardless of what we've done. And for those of us who believe in his son, Jesus, he has forgiven us of everything. Jesus took everything on the cross. Remember, he took us from being objects of wrath to becoming children who are just awaiting his grace forever. That all happened through the cross. But then the Bible also says without faith, it's impossible to please him. So there's a sense in which we need to believe in what he's done on the cross. But the Bible also says there are things that we do that are actually pleasing to him. It's like when I see my daughters leading worship up here, it pleases me. That doesn't mean I don't love them if they don't lead worship. It's just when they're there and they, I don't know, there's just something there. I'm like, oh, that's so cool. I just love it. I just love it. It's just pleasing to me. I mean, if they never led worship again, I'd still love them. But there's just something about certain things we do that, that please other people. And it's just that thought of, God, are there things I could do? Like even right now as I'm teaching about you, can I teach about you in a way that pleases you? Because I believe there's ways that I could, 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 you know, open this book and teach, and he's not pleased by it. And just because we sing songs doesn't mean he's pleased by those songs. We see it in all the, in the scriptures all the time. He flat out says in Malachi 1, he goes, I wish you would shut the doors to that temple because I am not pleased with you and I will not receive your offerings. You know, wow. So there's, there are ways in which we, we sing and teach and give that he says, that's not pleasing to me. But isn't it the desire of our hearts to worship in such a way, to give in such a way, to love each other in such a way that God says, ah, I love your faith. That so pleases me. Everyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Well, tonight we're going to um, have my wife come up and uh, read a couple of chapters. Uh, Hebrews chapter 10 and chapter 11. And I know that... Um, that's a lot of reading. Uh, but this is the word of God. Like, I hope this is why you come. It's like, I don't want to hear someone's opinion. I came, I want to hear straight from heaven. And we believe these words, the Bible says, are living and active. 
It says they're sharper than a two-edged sword. It's, it's like it, it somehow gets into the very soul of who you are. And, and these are the words of life. And so I'm going to just pray that you are able to stay focused and that you just drink from this. You just enjoy this. These are words of life. You may have had people insult you, scream at you this week, lie to you. You probably watched shows that were just filled with like just dirt, you know? And yet this is the time where God speaks to us through his very word and cleanses us and gets rid of all opinion. And so it doesn't matter what everyone thinks in this room. Thus saith the Lord. This is what he says. So God, right now, would your Holy Spirit fall upon us in a way where you give us the ability to focus and enjoy and even tremble at your words from heaven, knowing this is higher than what anyone on earth has ever spoken. These are your words. This is the word of God. Thank you, Lord, that we can come here tonight and listen to you in Jesus' name. For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sins? But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body have you prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. When he said above, you have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings, these are offered according to the law. Then he added, behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. And by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us. For after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. 
For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But recall the former days when, after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. For yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and persevere for their souls. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the people of old received their commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. By faith Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous. God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. And he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man, and him as good as dead, were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven, and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country." 
that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. By faith, Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. By faith, Jacob, when dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, bowing in worship over the head of his staff. By faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith, he kept the Passover and sprinkled the blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch them. By faith, the people crossed the Red Sea as on dry land, but the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell you of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to fight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. I just love hearing the Word of God. It just reminds me about what life is all about. It just cleanses me of just stupid thoughts that I've thought all week. You know, it just doesn't matter. Here's what matters. And, and when you hear that list of all these different people, I hope you don't listen. And I know it's hard, but I hope you don't listen to that list you know, Abraham, Noah, Moses, you know, Enoch, all of these people and go, wow, almost look at them like beyond reach, like superheroes. Because that's the opposite of faith. 
If you're looking at these people like they're unattainable, then you're doing the exact thing that this passage is telling you not to do, which is, oh, well, that's for them. God can use them for great things. But to not think that it's the same God that we worship tonight. It's the same God who's in this room. That, that's what it means. It's like, do you believe this? And then it describes those who died for their faith and they didn't get an earthly reward, but they knew by faith something better is coming. And God is saying, look, this is what it takes to please me. I want you to actually believe in what I say. Like when Jesus says in John 14, verse 12, he says, the things that you've seen me do, you will do these things also, and even greater things than these, because I'm going to the Father. So what would our lives look like if we truly had faith and we really believed? The greatest joys in my life as I look back over these 56 years of life, what were the greatest moments? What were the greatest seasons? For me, there were times when Lisa and I did things out of faith where we're like, let's just do it. Let's just do it. I don't know how it's going to end up, but I think God's calling us to do this, to give this, to go there, to live, whatever it is. And every time afterwards, watching the way God would come through. A lot of times, it, it, it rarely was how we imagined it in our minds. But every time he came through, and we're like, wow. I, I don't know what life would be like right now if I had never taken steps of faith. I just go, gosh, what a, what a dull life. I'd be sitting here going, gosh, I kind of just played it safe. I kind of just did what everyone else did. I just kind of lived one day after the next. And I would sit here with so much regret. And yet I'm looking back and trying to think, was there ever a time I did something by faith and I now regret it? And there really, I can't think of one. Again, not that it, it works out the way I think it's going to, but every time. And so it's true that without faith, it's impossible to please God. But it's also true that as we do these things in faith, he rewards us. He really rewards us in different ways. Like in, in, in the book of Hebrews, he's explaining these different people. Each one got different rewards, but a lot of them didn't even get to see the reward on earth. And that was an amazing faith on their part because they were so sure of what was coming to them. Last, uh, last Friday, I was looking at the crowd and that was here and I was just thinking, wow, there's a lot of young people. I mean, it's a few more old people this time. But last time, it just felt very young. Like, gosh, is anyone even 30 in this room? You know, and I, and I started thinking about um, how when I was your age, there were certain patterns that I set in life, having no idea that many years later, decades later, I'd be like, I am so glad that I set some of these patterns early in life. Um, and I'm going to, I remember being young and hearing old people talk. And they would talk about the good old days and everything else. And I always thought that was so weird. But I got to do it now. <laughs> like, it's just because when you grow up in a different time and you experience different things, you're like so eager for everyone else to get it. You know, I mean, I grew up in a time, you know, I, I, in the 70s, great time, um, bell bottoms, tie-dye shirts. But it was just this time, though, where you knew on Sunday everything was closed. 
There are no stores open on Sunday. The bank's not even open on Sunday. If you wanted cash, back then we used this stuff called cash. And, uh, but if you wanted it, you'd have to remember to get it on Friday because Saturday and Sunday, you can't get money. It's before ATMs, you know? I mean, it was just one of those things where Sunday you shut down. There's no store to go to. You just hang out, you laugh, you talk, you rest, you worship. And then I remember, you know, it was in the, in the mid-70s, late-70s, suddenly one store would open. And, you know, and, and, and of course, all of us were like, gosh, I want to go get them, but everything's closed. Everything's closed. But then I remember when that one store opened, everyone flooded there because it was the only place open. So suddenly other shop owners are going, he gets all the business because he's open on Sunday. And then pretty soon this whole thing started happening where now Sunday is just another day. And you guys grew up in a time where you never got to experience that. I mean, it used to be like if, if I had a conversation with someone like, I, I just don't have a phone anywhere near me, you know? I mean, everything was, the, I, you know, I lived in a time when they, you know, you dial like this, and, you know, you wait for it to go back. And, and you know, sometimes your finger would go too far, and, you know, whatever else. It was just, but that was the norm. We didn't have answering machines. We didn't care. It was just such a good time, and, and you go out, and you, you, you'd play outside. You went outside, you know? There were no apps to play, nothing. You just went outside. You rode your bike. You played sports. You'd laugh. You, oh, man, it was just such a great time of life. Credit cards were weird. It's like we just didn't, we just, like, who would want to get in debt? Like, this was the mindset. I, tithing to the church, giving a tenth to the church, that was just normal. It wasn't like this free. These things were expected. No one worked on Sunday. Everyone was giving 10%. It was just, this was life. And, I mean, I was just taught at a young age, hey, you don't work on Sundays. And you always give your best to the Lord. So that first 10% of whatever you make, you give to him. That was something instilled in me as a teenager. Working at Taco Bell for $3.35 an hour. Um, that was right when minimum wage went up. So it was like, it, it's just, yeah, I'm going to give to the Lord. At least 10%. And I remember talking, and, and remember at church, a guy that was talking about how he gave extra, and he, he would give an extra percent every year. And he started off at like 20% of his income he'd give to the Lord. He goes, I'm just going to see if I can give more and more and more every year. I'll give at least another percentage. And he was an older guy, and he says, so now I'm giving 90% of my money to the church and living off of 10 like God just kept blessing, blessing, blessing. And I'd hear these stories of faith, and it inspired me. I thought, okay, I'm going to go for that. I'm going to believe in these things. And we just set these patterns in our lives. But what happens is the world starts changing, and then the world will always try to pull you into living the way they do. To where pretty soon your life looks like everyone around you. But if you look in the scriptures, what pleased God. Okay, if you look in the Old Testament, he goes, okay, this is the way all the nations around you are going to live. But you, Israel, I want you because you are my people. If my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways. He, was, he goes, I want my people to be different. 
See, the, Israel, the, the nation of Israel was located in a place where all the nations would have to go through it for trade or for whatever. It was just the central location. So God's plan was, I want you guys to live differently. I don't care how everyone else lives. They don't know my law. They don't know my words. I want them to see you and how I'm going to bless you. So when everyone else is working seven days a week, you remember my Sabbath. And you remember, no, we're following the God who created the world in six days, and on seventh day he rests, and they're going to see how I'm going to prosper you because of that. When everyone's hoarding everything to themselves, I want you to give freely to those who are in need. And I always want you to give to me first. Why? So I can bless you. That's what he says in Malachi 3. He goes, test me. See if I don't open the floodgates of heaven and just pour out, just shower this blessing upon you. God wants his people. Okay, so what God wants us now is to believe in him and to believe that we can never be hurt by sacrificing for him. If you have your Bibles, um, in Mark chapter 10, in Mark chapter 10, verse uh, Mark 10, verse 28, Peter began to say to him, See, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel will not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. So Peter's like, Jesus, I gave everything up for you. And Jesus looks at him and goes, look, whatever you gave up for me, I'll give you a hundred times that. He says, I don't care what you sacrificed. I will give you a hundred times whatever you've sacrificed. Do you believe that? So if you believe that whatever you sacrifice for the kingdom, you get a hundredfold back. It's like if tonight I go, look, whatever amount of money you give me, I'll give you a hundred times that next Friday. How much money would you give me? Depends how much you trust me, right? If you really trusted me, You'd probably give me everything you could possibly come up with. See, that's, that's this picture. He goes, look, I, I promise this. So, and, and remember, God says, look, without faith, it's impossible to please me. He goes, so I, I want the people, if you want to please me, then you've got to believe that I'm going to reward you if you earnestly seek me. That's what that whole list in Hebrews 11 was all about. Here's a bunch of people who believed his promise. Hey, I'll, you can saw me in half. Go for it. You can throw me in the fire. Do it. Here's everything I own. It's fine. God's going to give me more. You know, I just want to share. I always get a little hesitant sharing this stuff, but I feel like it's testifying to God. I hope you take it in the right spirit. 
Because the Bible says, that, like, when you give, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. Like, you just do it in secret. You don't do it to be seen by men. Like, your heart can't be like, I want everyone to see what I'm about to give. Um, then on the flip side of that, he says, let your light shine before men so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So it's like, okay, which is it? Do I not let anyone know or do I let people know? You know? And so there's this side in which it's like, it, the way I understand it is you don't, want to, you don't want to say it to be seen. Like that's not your motive. It's because you want glory for yourself but you want praise to God. And I just, I just want to share that every time Lisa and I gave by faith, we, we were actually confused for a while because we didn't want anything in return. We actually just wanted to sacrifice for the Lord. And so we'd never given just 10%. You know, we're like, okay, let's, let's try 20%. Let's, let's just give this away. Look, there's only 50 bucks left on our account. Let's just throw it in the offering. You know, like it's, this person needs it more than we do. And then mysteriously, we, I remember the first time we did, we came home and I don't know why we checked the mailbox because mail didn't come on Sunday. I don't know if it does now. We don't check. We only check it once a week. But uh a check was in the mail on Sunday in our mailbox. We're like, what the heck? Like, well, we were supposed to have nothing left. And then it would come through. And back then, you know, I was making $3,000 a month. And it was plenty. It was good. It, it was an awesome time in the church because the church was growing like crazy. And... Uh, and it was such a great relationship because every year the elders and the church would say, would you guys please take more money? And every year we'd like, we don't need more money. Like God keeps providing for everything. So it's very opposite of like, you know, usually at work you're like, gosh, can I get a raise? And the boss says no. Here it's like, would you take a raise? And we're like, no. And it was just like this great, like we love what we do. We don't need any more. And I just thought, let's just try to give more. I remember when you're just thinking, I'm going to try to give 10,000 of our 36,000 away. You know? And we did it. And I thought, okay, Lord, this next year I want to see if I can give away 18,000. I just feel like you're wanting to stretch my faith. And then we did it. And then the next year I felt like, God, I want to give away 36,000, my whole salary, and money will just come from somewhere else. And we did it. And then I'm like, okay, I want to give away more than my salary this year. I want to try to give away $50,000, you know? We did it. And I'm like, okay, okay, let's get crazy here. I want to give away 100 grand. I want to give away 100000 I don't know. I've never made that much. I want to give it away. We did it. And then it got insane, insane. Because in my head, I think to my, I have this number in my head. And I'm like, there's no way. All right, I want to give away a million dollars. And we did it. And we started giving away about a million dollars a year. You guys, that's just craziness. This is just, I, I, I say this, you know, I wrote a book, I wrote a couple more books, and who knew I could write? You know, it, it's, just, it's just this crazy stuff. And I remember even praying, I go, God, because I, I remember, I, you know, I knew rich people, and they were always pretty stingy. And I'm like, that's so weird, God. Why are they so... St I mean, I go, I, and I told God, if you ever made me rich, I'd give it all away. 
Because I'm so happy. Like, there's nothing compared to praying and having the God of the universe answer you. To know that I have a direct line to God. He listens to me. So who cares what I drive or what I wear? Or what I talk to God like I know God. And I remember just telling him, I go, Lord, you know, I don't want to stand all these rich people. Like, why don't you raise up a new generation of rich people, people that will live like everyone else and give their money away because they believe in eternity, because they believe I'll get a hundred times this in the life to come. I said, so God, make me rich. I'll give it away. I don't care. God's like, all right. You guys, I seriously, I was like mapping it out. I'm like, I don't think I'll make a million dollars in my whole lifetime. And, and so people go, wow, God's grace on your life that you could make those millions of dollars. And I go, no, that's not grace. The grace is that I didn't care and I could give it all away. I go, God, that's so cool. That is so cool that you have blessed me so much with knowing you and your presence right here with me and everything you've done for me. And I know that eternity is coming, that you didn't give millions of dollars and it's all gone now. And I am so happy. And there's no regret like, oh, I should have kept a few. It's just, this is great. And I don't anticipate writing anymore or whatever and I really don't care I share this because I want you guys at your age to understand that knowing God is so good and just seeing him work fills you up you know when when Justin was talking about he eats of me you, you never get hungry it's like God you're right like I'm not craving anything. I'm not longing. That was the difference. That's why he goes, I give you these commands. Thou shall not covet. That means don't go, oh, I want that. I'd like to have that. I see what he has or she has and I want. He goes, don't do that. That's one of the Ten Commandments. They go, no, I'm I'm happy. I'm happy where I live. I, I I'm happy with my life. I'm content. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I shall not covet. I hope you understand my uh, heart in sharing that with you is to tell you that I'm not saying that, hey, start giving now. God will make you rich. That's not the point. And I know there's preachers out there that'll say that and and do that. I just don't see that in Scripture. I do see that he prospers you. But he prospers you in such a way that you don't care if he prospers you financially. You actually go, wow, I can now give more to the poor. I can actually care for all these different people. That's a blessing. And I and I remember in the early days, you know, when we were trying to give more and more and People are like, they would just doubt. And they go, well, what if you and Lisa, you give away so much that you end up starving to death? I'm like, really? In America? <laughs> Who starves to death? There's, you know, like food pantries everywhere. You know, it's, it's, and I said, look, first of all, God promises if you seek his kingdom first, and his righteousness, that everything else will be taken care of. So he's got that promise. But let's just say he forgot. And I give everything away, and Lisa and I starve to death and enter into the presence of God. And go, yeah, I thought you were going to come through, and we ended up starving. Like, what a great way to enter heaven, right? All skinny. Like, it's just, I go, I gave it all. And he's like, oh, man, (laughs) all you can eat. You know, like, it's just, 
It's a hundred times like to believe this and to enjoy life. This is the way God wants his people to live. Just kind of carefree. I know that if I give to the Lord, I'll be blessed for it. And I don't regret a dime I've given. I really don't. I'm so grateful. I have regrets over some things I bought. I'm like, that was stupid. That was a waste of money. We've all done that. But not over anything we've given. I gave my faith. Whether that person uses it properly for the kingdom. You know, I'll research a little bit. But I can't control it. You got to just give. Give. And what's interesting, even though I've seen God do so many miracles and answer so many prayers. It's weird how there's still a pull to try to play it safe now. Like there's something, you know, the enemy's always in my head like, well, you're old now, you know, you can retire, you can play it safe, you kind of did your thing, tell the kids to go out and live by faith. And I'm just like, no, no, I got to fight that. There's always going to be a pull to luxury, security, safety, rather than Romans 11, living by faith and living by faith till the end. 